I'd like to welcome you to our worship today at First Presbyterian Church in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And we welcome those who are worshiping with us electronically. We are glad that you are here present and also with us on your devices. Let us worship God with our opening prayer. Will you bow in prayer with me? Almighty and everlasting God, who established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant all of us who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body that we may show in our lives what we profess by our faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I call your attention to the announcements that are printed for you in the bulletin. Krisha has a special announcement, something to add to the update about our pastor search. Will you please come? Hello, I'm Krisha Brister, and I, along with Kim Moran and Lila Mendel, am a member of the Interim Pastor Search Committee. We wanted to give you a quick update about our work. We have met as a committee several times with Joanne Kublik, who is our uh, representative from Presbytery, and she is terrific. She's helping us with this process. Our committee has also met with Session, as well as the Admin and Finance Committee, to discuss the best way forward for our church. We've made a lot of progress and will continue to work on this important task and keep you posted as we have updates. We ask for your continued prayers as we go through this process. Thank you. I have a couple other announcements. I'd like to add to the prayer list. Uh, Phyllis Merritt, notice she's not here in choir today. She ended up in the hospital up in Niceville. She had some um, stomach problems. So prayer, prayers for Phyllis and all those who are listed are certainly in order. I'm happy to tell you Matt Berry, who's sitting back there, um, son-in-law, is feeling better from his back surgery. And, and we told the office, after this week, you can take him off. So that, that means prayers have worked. And uh, we hope that that's true for others. Notice, choir's down. As we, Nancy and I leave, that's, we're leaving tomorrow to go back to Michigan. And uh, so we hope that we have a safe journey. You can pray for that. But if you sing, or if you know somebody who does sing, really, the choir is a fun place to be, and they don't bite you. Even if you sing a wrong note once in a while, because they let me in. Um, so if you know somebody who likes to sing, Invite them to come and be in our choir. Hey, that's a kind of evangelism anyways. And um, I guess you ought to be inviting people to come too. After the sermon today, that'll be one of your challenges, to invite someone you know to come and worship here at Fort Walton Beach First Presbyterian. The other announcements I think are self-understanding, and I just call your attention to them. My good wife, Nancy, will now lead us in worship. Let us call ourselves to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The living Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Hear what the good shepherd says to us as we gather for this celebration. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Love is not just a matter of words, but it is deeds of justice and mercy. Let us worship God with a love that grows larger and closer as the closer we come to each other, and which grows more inclusive the more the closer we come to God. Praise and thanksgiving be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Stand as you are able, please, and sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
may be seated. Together, let us confess our sins to God. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in the newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. God will lead us into places of hope. God will give us the waters of life to strengthen us. God will be with us in every moment, in every place in our lives. Anointed with grace, fed with joy and wonder, we offer blessing and thanksgiving to the one who forgives us now and forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing, Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim. be seated. Together let us pray that we might hear and understand God's word. O God, whose son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, 
forever and ever. Amen. I will be reading the 23rd Psalm today, one which I'm sure most of you have all know. And I don't know what's on the screen, but I'm going to be reading the King James Version because that's what I learned as a child. And somehow changing it, I just like the old one. I, I often don't, but I do this, this one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'm going to make an, <laughs> a comment here because there's one word in that line that really gets me, and that's through. It doesn't say I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. It says through. That tells me that there is an end to whatever we are experiencing, whenever we experience it. So listen to it with that thought in mind. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
when we arrived back in Michigan, where we live the other half of our life, one of the things I'll certainly miss is singing with my friends here in this choir. Um, maybe that can be your gift too. So what I said earlier, help us. The gospel today is from John's gospel, the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 19. These words should be familiar to you. It was late Sunday evening. The disciples were gathered together behind locked doors. Because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples called Thomas, also called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors. Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy those who believe without seeing me. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. And then I'm going to turn to the reading from Acts for today. It's the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 36 through verse 43. You may not be so familiar with this passage. In Joppa, there was a woman named Tabitha, who was a believer. Her name in Greek is Dorcas, meaning a deer. That's spelled D-E-E-R, a deer. She spent all her time doing good and helping the poor. At the time she got sick, at that time, she got sick and died. Her body was washed and laid in a room upstairs. Joppa is not so far from Lydia. And when the believers in Joppa heard that Peter was in, well, it's Lydda. Okay, it's my eyes. They went two men to Peter with this message. Please hurry. And come to us. So Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, he was taken to the room upstairs. 
where all the widows crowded around him, crying and showing him all the shirts and coats that Dorcas had made while she was alive. Peter put them all out of the room. And he knelt down and he prayed. Then he turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Peter reached over and helped her get up. Then he called all the believers, including the widows, and presented her alive to them. The news about this spread all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for many days with a tanner by the name of Simon. Here endeth the reading of God's word for us today. May he bless it to our understanding. Amen. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of leading in you in worship some of the Sundays through this winter and spring. And for today, the fourth Sunday of Easter and Mother's Day. I'd like to share a few things that my mother taught me. Maybe some of these will be familiar to you. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. Quote, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <coughs> My mother taught me religion. Quote, you better pray that that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me time travel. Quote, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> My mother taught me logic. Quote, because I said so, that's why. <laughs> My mother taught me more logic. If you fall out of that swing, and break your neck, you're not going to the store with me. <laughs> Maybe this one rings home. My mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean un underwear in case you're in an accident. I don't know why. She always worried that somehow if we show up at an emergency room and we have dirty underwear. We never had dirty underwear. And you know what? They were always white, you know, because she boiled them on the stove with, in bleach water. So you know about that. I could tell you another story. After my mother died, and I was in ninth grade, and I had two younger brothers, one in fourth and one in fifth grade, and an older brother going to community college. Um, we took turns doing the laundry, and I don't know who did it, but somehow those perfectly white briefs and T-shirts got mixed in with a red shirt. You know how embarrassing it is to go to gym class when you're a boy and have pink underwear? <laughs> and, and you're sitting there thinking, well, why didn't you get other clothes or new ones? Uh-uh, there was no money. You wore pink underwear. Well, we bleached them, tried. They stayed pink. <laughs> My mother taught me irony, and I won't do too many more of these. She says, keep crying, and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> oh, you know that one. My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. <laughs> awesome. 
My mother taught me about contortionism. Will you look at that dirt on the back of your neck? <laughs> My mother taught me about hypocrisy. If I told you once, I told you a million times, don't exaggerate. <laughs> My mother taught me about medical science. I skipped a few. If you don't stop crossing your eyes like that, they're going to get stuck that way. I don't know. And this one, my mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. Mother's Day. Now, I have a question to ask you. What map did you bring to church today? Or if you're watching on electronically, what map do you use? What map did you bring to church? Maybe I should explain. Here's what I mean. All of us are familiar with maps. Road maps, for example, and, and I thought about if I, when I was sitting up here waiting for worship, I should have gone out and gathered up a bunch of highway road maps and passed them out and made you all open them up and then said, I have a $20 bill if you can fold it up exactly the way it belongs. <laughs> You know, you open them, and especially when you're in a car, and in the days before air conditioning and the wind was blowing, the road map was a real struggle. I wonder, did anybody bring an Easter map? An Easter map. There was a British actor named Robert Morley. Before he died... He made it known when he was buried, he wanted all of his credit cards to be put in the casket with him. The London Times received a host of letters after Morley's funeral, and the word got out about the credit cards. Questions came in wondering, why did Morley want his credit cards for the next life, for the hereafter. Throughout history, archaeologists have been digging up burial tombs of people all over the world. And amazingly, they find all sorts of things buried with these people. Whole boats, completely Perfect boats, tools, money, jewelry, food. Nancy and I, on my bucket list, I wanted to go to China. And after we were married, we did that. One of the places my bucket list says I want to go see the Terracotta Cotta Army that one of the emperors buried with him. It's a whole army, full size people buried with the emperor so that he'd have his army with him in the next life. Remember Morley and the letters to the London Times. One of the letters had a strange request. She said, her name was Heather Tanner. She said when she died, she wanted a good map buried with her. She wrote, and I quote, I have intense trouble finding my way in this life. So I'm extremely worried about finding my way in the life to come. She wanted a good map buried with her. And, and, and I quote, she said, a good map, which sort of implied there may be some bad maps. John Alexander wrote a book entitled The Warrior's Edge. He talks about reality maps, 
reality maps. He defines what he means. He says, reality maps are our way or our ways of looking at the world that's all around us. It's really our belief system. Let me give you an example. You know I would. We are told that during the time of Homer, about the 10th century BC, Greek sailors never sailed their boats out of sight of land. They stayed close to the coast because their reality map said, told them, ships that go too far away from the shore would be lost. According to their belief system, the sea was filled with deadly monsters. Their reality maps limited their travels to the coastlines. Here's another example. For hundreds of years, European sailors navigated by their reality map that said the world was flat. They believed that. And if you sailed too far, you would fall off. That's what their reality map said. Along came Christopher Columbus, and he changed that. But it's interesting to note, Christopher Columbus, his own reality map told him when he found new land out there across the ocean that he sailed on, because he believed it was round. He thought he was in India, and he saw people there, and he called those natives Indians. And lo and behold, in this country at least, we still call Native Americans Indians. Fifteen ninety seven. The country was Spain. Juan Combe returned from his trip to the New World. He made it to South America. He came home and he was celebrated as a hero. They had a parade. He was a celebrity in town. He could go in any tavern and get free drinks. I'm not sure that was true, but I added that. People flocked to hear him tell of his adventures, his stories, things that he had seen in the New World. He was wined and dined. It did say this in the article. Toast of the town. And then one day, it rained in Spain. Now, you know, Spain doesn't get a lot of rain, but that day it rained. And lo and behold, Juan Combe ran home, and he put on this cape that he brought from the New World, and he walked through the streets. Remember, he was a hero. He was waving, and he was talking to people out in the rain. And lo and behold, the cape that he was wearing kept his clothes that were under the cape dry. The reality map of the people of Spain at that time they were very suspicious, and they believed this cape must be magic. One tried to explain. It was a rubber-coated cape that he brought from the New World. And the people there made this cape in the New World. Explanations didn't satisfy anyone. And the authorities arrested him. And they put him on trial. Because before the judge, they said, he's wearing this curious garment that somehow keeps him dry. He was convicted, found guilty, of wearing a cape through which water would not pass. 
And the judge said, you are interfering with the will of God because the will of God says the rain will drench the just and the unjust. They said, you have practiced witchcraft, for which the penalty is, you want to guess? Death. Their reality map would not let them handle a new product called rubber. Rubber. Now, why did I go through all this trouble to tell you that? I want you to see how limiting our reality maps can be. One more example, maybe a little closer to our lives. The year was 1910. The country was Australia, and there was a nurse. Her name was Elizabeth Kenny, and she developed a new treatment for people who were suffering with polio. Her treatment used heat, massage, therapeutic exercises. This went against the reality maps of the other doctors in Australia. What treatment did they use if you had polio? Well, they put splints on your legs and arms to keep them straight. But they also immobilized you and your muscles. Sister Kenny demonstrated her procedures and that if you immobilize the muscles more, it eventually killed the nerves. It didn't matter. No matter how much Sister Kenny proved that her methods worked, the reality maps of those in charge would not accept a cure. The orthopedists in Queensland eventually convinced the Royal Commission that was investigated to try to solve this dilemma that they issued a 300-page document denouncing Sister Kenny and denying her any funds to continue to run her clinics and do this treatment. Sister Kenny left Australia and she came to the United States of America and her theories revolutionized the treatment for anyone who had received the disease called polio. Okay, today we have the Salk and Sabin vaccines and my goodness, I grew up in the generation we were afraid to go to the movies, afraid to go swimming because of polio. But then we got the vaccines that prevent polio. But anyone who was afflicted with that disease was treated with Sister Kinney's treatments and methods. And that's still true today. The reality maps of the Australian doctors preventing them from seeing the truth. People have all kind of reality maps today. What's yours? What's your belief system? I'm not asking you to recite a creed or to mimic back the catechism. I'm asking you to think about what beliefs you hold true, what ideas influence how you live that guides your life. There are people whose reality maps say life ends at the grave when you die. The great actress Sarah Bernhardt believed that. When you died, that was it. So what did Sarah Bernhardt do with her belief system? She went out 
and she purchased a coffin, a full-size coffin. And she had them deliver it to her bedroom, and it was at the feet of her bed. When she traveled to do shows, wherever she went, she paid to have the coffin shipped to the same place where she had to stay, put at the foot of her bed. Why would she do that? She explained, because people asked. This is to remind me, my body will soon be dust, and only my acting glory will live forever in the minds of people. That's a quote from Sarah Bernhardt. So her coffin, her casket, was her reminder, inspired her to do her best in her acting today as she faced each new day. It was her reality map. Her belief system said, there's no life after death. She might as well do everything she could here in life so people would remember. Okay, we live in a society, a world that's modern. People go to great ends to extend their human life here. There's, there are people who have left instructions that when they die, they have their bodies frozen, preserved, frozen, so that when in the future we dis discover how to cure whatever they died from or with, then they would be unfrozen and healed and brought back to life. Others are taking a different track. They are saving their cells, their DNA cells, so that sometime in the future, their DNA cells can be rejuvenated and they can return to life. If your reality map says, this is all there is, life ends with death, then you might join the parade of people who grasp, who cling to any ideas they can find to preserve life, to cheat death. Because their reality map says death is the end of the line. What was the reality map of the followers of Jesus after crucifixion, death, burial in the tomb, oh, and the first Easter? The picture we get in the New Testament is a group of people who are demoralized. Their dreams have been shattered. Their hopes gone, their leader, their master, their Messiah was dead and buried. There seems to be nothing less to do but to go home. And we have recordings or accounts of some were, were doing that, going back on the road to Emmaus, back to work, The dream that they had with the Galilean is over. They had so many hopes. He promised a new kingdom. But kings don't die on a cross like a criminal. He spoke of God, his father. And when he seemed, God abandoned him when he needed God the most. He died. 
and all seemed lost. Finished. But that was before the stone was rolled away. And he wasn't there. And then reports kept coming in. He's alive. We saw him. He spoke to us. And over these weeks you've been hearing the accounts of the first Easter. From me and from Pastor Jim and, and hopefully from your own readings. It doesn't surprise me, it doesn't discourage me that when I look at these accounts, they're sort of jumbled, sort of mixed up. Um, they don't all fit together like my fingers. I can see how that could happen. They're not following somebody's finely, de finely designed script. They were simply living the events of the first Easter. Everyone agrees. Women went to the tomb, and Mary Magdalene was one of them, and the, and the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away, and Jesus was alive. They saw him alive. Can you just imagine how that news entered their ears? Never again would they think about death in the same way. The reality map about death was destroyed. The stone was rolled away. Jesus was alive. Never again would death be the same. At one time, the people thought the world was flat. Columbus sailed his ships, and the stone was rolled away. The world was changed forever. At one time, scientists and theologians believed the earth was the center of the universe. Then Galileo rolled the stone away. Never again would humans have that perspective of the universe. At one time, people attributed illness to all kinds of strange reasons. Illness, sickness, was caused by who knows what. Louis Pasteur did research and told us about bacteria and germs, and a stone was rolled away. Well, it took a while, but the stone was rolled away. Remember the four-minute mile barrier? Four-minute mile. Nobody could run a mile in four minutes, under four minutes. Huh. Isn't it impossible? 1954, Roger Bannister did the impossible. He ran a four-minute mile. He broke the barrier. Huh. There isn't a first-class runner today who can't run faster than a four-minute mile. A stone had been rolled away. Nothing can be the same again. That's the good news on the fourth Sunday of Easter in the Easter season. Jesus had risen from the dead. Pastor Jim taught us to shout that. He has risen indeed. Yes, he has. The teachings he did were validated. Nothing could be the same again. Lives are changed. We have new meaning, new purpose, new energy. Why? The stone was rolled away. In my lifetime, I used to be a, a fair photographer. I had a 35 millimeter film camera. And I took slides of trips. Um, I also loved to take pictures of sunrises and sunsets. Oh, what a beautiful sunrise. Look, I put it on the screen. What a beautiful sunset. Look, I put it on the screen. But you know, it's been a long time. I'm going to be 85 next week. 
And now when I look at those slides, if I don't, if it's not labeled, I look at the slide and I say, oh, is this a sunrise or a sunset? I can't tell. Sunrise, sunset, oh, it's beautiful. Sunrise or sunset? I'm not sure. Death is like that to a lot of people. Is it the beginning or the end? Depends on your reality map. If you don't accept Jesus rose from the grave, then I guess death is the end for you. If the empty tomb and our Lord's resurrection is part of how you believe, the first Easter is a sunrise, a new beginning, a new way to live life. Easter Sunday changes our reality maps concerning death and the meaning of life from now on. Dusk, the end of the day, becomes the dawn of a new day. The enemy that we call death becomes a friend. We call it new life. The stone has been rolled away. So what's your reality map? You heard me, some of you, talk about the fact that earlier, since we came down to be a snowbird, I had a dream. And all at night, I was thinking about this dream about living in the red. This kept going through my head, living in the red. I never preached that whole dream to you, and I'm not today. You heard me talk about living in the red. Jesus' birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, the cross. We even referenced the fact that there are so many crosses in this building. Simply put, the dream was saying, we live in the red to God. Why? Everything goes back to God. The beginning of all creation, the start of all things, life as we know it, God. We all live in the red to God. And we owe God so much. I keep my ears tuned. You know, some people from our church here tell me, well, the church lives in the red. But what's the reality map of that? We we're trying to hire a new pastor, but we may only have enough funds to pay somebody for five years as we spend down our endowment because we're living in the red. Okay, what's our reality map? Change. New energy to work. New ideas for growth. Gee whiz, more giving? Oh, at a level no one ever dreamed? Yep. I don't know. I simply do not know. You see, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know about the future. I do know today is Mother's Day. And when I think about it, you think about it, we all have had a mother, a father, grandparents, family. I'm an old preacher now. I've learned over the years that some people have good memories and bad memories of their past life history. Over the years, I've heard stories of people who hated Mother's Day or Father's Day because those bad memories would be conjured up. And in several cases, people told me, 
I stay away from those Mother's Day programs. You know, when the children, when we had children, would read little poems or show pictures that they made in their classes. They said they, they didn't come to those. Nevertheless, I would say, we all still owe our mothers, our fathers, our ancestors for our being here. However, your mind thinks about it. We have living in the red to our ancestors. Every Christian lives in the red to Jesus. His payment with his blood for our sins. That's the cross. That's Good Friday. That's the passion. And his death in all its pain and blood are real. God paid the price. And we are in the red for that. In closing, look at the apostles in today's scripture. Where did they go, at least most of them, after Jesus' death and burial? Where were they on the first Easter what was their reality map? It was late Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Jesus came to them. Where were they? Nancy and I, research the records. We tried to find out, what do the experts say? Where was the room that they were gathered in? Everyone seems to think it was the upper room. The same room, a few days earlier, they celebrated the Passover meal. There. Jesus washed their feet. There. The place where they shared bread and wine. There. The table where we have Holy Communion started there. The upper room. Now I tried to prefix this. The experts can't 100% prove that. But that's what they think. What's my reality map here? They didn't go back to Golgotha and kneel down and worship that hill where Jesus died. I don't think they honored the cross. They went back to the upper room. Jesus came to them. They meet Jesus again at the table where they shared that holy meal. I don't know what lies ahead for me, for you, or for this church here at Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I do know we do not walk alone. Nancy said it better than I can. The 23rd Psalm says we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And God is with us in that journey, in this journey. We always have a choice to make. And our reality map helps us along the way. I read to you the reading from Acts. You know, I don't know. I've ever read that passage before in a worship service after all these years but I read it today Peter with God's help brought a person back to life from death wow my reality map says hope I pray 
I believe this table will be here in the future. We have Holy Communion here. We worship God here. We all need to walk by faith into the future. With God's help, finding new ways to reach people for Jesus will happen. That's my reality map. Amen. Let's see. I've got to find a bulletin. I'm totally out of it now. Oh, I wrote them. We, we found a, a road map litany. So please get your look at the screen or get your bulletin. Follow with me. People of God, I urge you to live life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Please join together and read the next section. Remember, Remember that one time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Come to him, a living stone, rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We don't receive offerings through the pews because of COVID and we're continuing that practice. But that doesn't mean offerings aren't needed. Tithes and offerings keep the church alive. So if you're here or if you're listening electronically, we hope you would respond to our request for funds. My first wife and I agreed to tithe early when we were married. We didn't have very much at all. But you know, we gave God that tithe and, and we never regretted it. We were always blessed and he continues to bless me mightily. So let us pray. God our Father, all we have, all we own belong to you. We give you thanks and praise today for our gifts. Bless the gifts that people bring to this church that enable it to survive, to continue to break bread and to share the cup, to provide for ministry and to help the needy. So bless our gifts today. Use them in your kingdom with your spirit's power. Amen. Would you continue to pray with me today? God, we ask your blessings to be upon us and all the people of this church. Our hearts 
our minds are filled with thanksgiving and praise to all that you have done. We have prayer requests. We lift up Phyllis Merritt, the Trigg family, Fred Pryor, Sandy Taylor, the Bolger family, Roger Hewson, Jenny Langham, Teresa Nix, Matt Berry, Kathy Tolbert, Leon Haynes, Jennifer Purit, Mitchell Moran, John Holland, Bob Naylor, Grace Moran, Autumn King, Marcia Dale, Tiffany Buffington, Doris Williamson, Nathaniel, Andre, and Christopher Moran, and others who need your gifts today. I don't know all these people. You know them. Fill their need, whatever it is. If there is pain, take it away. If there is illness, correct it. If there is words like, we can't do anything for you, God, we ask that you would do what needs to be done for that person. Give healing and strength and power to all. We have gathered before you in prayer and in worship. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is number 817. We walk by faith and not by sight. We sang it a couple weeks ago. I hope you'll sing it now. And now receive the benediction. Go out from this place, surfing on the wave of eternal life with Christ. Watch carefully. Keep your footing in faith. Be daring. Be strong. Let everything you do be done with love. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you from this time forth, even forevermore. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.